Good afternoon. I'm Judy Woodward, the History Coordinator of the Ramsey County Library, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this first in our new season of Great Decisions, this first event on international organizations in a global pandemic. Today's speaker, Dr. John Oswald, is an adjunct professor in community health and epidemiology at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. He has worked with the World Health Organization and the Pan American Health Organization in Cuba, Argentina, and Mexico. Today's program is brought to you with the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota, the Foreign Affairs Association, and Global Minnesota. We are deeply grateful to all of these organizations. Um, before we begin, I'd like to say a word about the briefing book, uh, which gives background for talks in the Great Decisions series. Even though we are now in February of 2022, today's talk is supported by the 2021 briefing book, which gives background to all the Great Decisions talks, uh, two of them in this year and the rest of them that took place last fall. The briefing book is available for purchase through our co-sponsoring organization, Global Minnesota. Because of their generosity, we also have a number of briefing books available for checkout at the library. Now, thank you very much. And I'd like to turn the podium over, the virtual podium over to our speaker, John Oswald, on international organizations in a global pandemic. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, and I'll share my screen here for um, the slides that I wanna um, review with you all today. Um, I guess a couple of introductory comments uh, are that um, um, I presented a year ago and it was really just around the time that the briefing book uh, from the Foreign Policy Institute that Judith had mentioned had just come out and uh, thinking back on this past year of how much has, has occurred, uh, but still um, I think that it's a, a very useful uh, uh, article. Um, it's just that you, there almost needs to be now a part two to that article that, uh, that hopefully um, the Foreign Policy Institute will, will put out soon. Um, and the second is that, uh, uh, of course, this topic of COVID-19 uh, of course, all of us have been living through this, and I'm sure there's lots and lots of questions. And so I'll try to keep my um, presentation um, a little bit shorter uh, to make sure that there's lots of time for questions from you all. And again, because, you know, uh, this is such a complicated set of issues, um, and despite my background in epidemiology, um, that I may not be able to answer them, but then certainly refer you to other, other folks such as Dr. Michael Osterholm's work uh, or other leading epidemiologists uh, um, that have been so eloquent and, 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 and comprehensive and accurate about their assessment of COVID-19 over the past two years. But today's topic is uh, international organizations and the role that they've played. And the title, of course, has um, the, the phrase global pandemic in more of a generic style rather than specifically COVID-19 um, and international organizations, again, in a generic format. And really what the focus of this today will be on the World Health Organization in particular, um, and of course, COVID-19 as the global pandemic in particular. But there's certainly other international organizations um, uh, that uh, you know are have been key players um, within the United Nations um, structure. Um, certainly, the United Nations General Assembly and especially the Security Council, um, and then other UN uh, agencies, um, and especially UNICEF, the Children's and Family support agency of the United Nations, UNICEF, um, and, um, and also even the International Trade Organization, ITO, um, when it comes to, when it has come to uh, intellectual property rights, say, of the vaccines. So it's been, you know, kind of an all hands on deck within the UN structure, 
but then outside of the UN, um, other, of course, each um, national government of, of, of every country in the world um, has its, you know, primary political responsibility, but there have been certain alliances uh, in Europe, the European community has played a key role um, uh, in the Americas, um, uh, North America, South, Central America, and South America, the Organization of American States. Um, and so that um, probably the most impactful um, uh, alliance of, of uh, nations has been what's um, called the G20. Actually, there's a G7, which is the seven largest economies of the world, um, with the exception of Russia, which was voted out of the G7 um, several years ago. Um, but you know, the United States, China, um, United Kingdom, France, uh, Germany, et cetera. Um, and, and then G20, though, which includes a, you know, 20 nations, the so larger. Uh, on top of the uh, G7, so countries like Brazil, India, and G20 has been probably the crucial organization for driving the financing of the vaccination program worldwide. Uh, in addition, um, there's uh, foundations and non-government organizations, and a real champion there has been the Gates Foundation, the Bill Gates, you know, Microsoft um, uh, uh, funded uh, foundation. And Bill Gates has had a, a really intense interest in um, international global health uh, for years and years and has been a real um, leader among foundations uh, in, in COVID, with COVID-19. Um, also, there are the um, support organizations uh, such as Doctors Without Borders, um, the Red Cro International Red Cross, um, so that there, there is a, a, a real spectrum of um, international organizations addressing COVID-19. And then in terms of global pandemics beyond COVID, um, in the past, of course, the one most kind of directly comparable was the Spanish flu of 1918. And of course the misnomer of it really didn't originate in Spain. It originated in a military base in Kansas. Um, there's a whole backstory how it got the name Spanish flu, um, but it really did become a worldwide pandemic, especially when uh, US soldiers went to Europe to fight in World War I, and then it spread you know, throughout Europe. And many of the dynamics of, um, the respiratory infection, um, uh, asymptomatic, um, the spikes, of course, that we've seen in COVID-19 were all hallmarks of the Spanish flu um, in 1918, with one major exception, and that was we have a vaccine. <laughs> we have a, a um, scientifically valid, effective set of vaccines that uh, can control the disease and certainly lessen the, the mortality and the severity of the disease. Um, and in, in the 1920s, the, um, that um, pandemic had to sort of um, kind of peter out rather than be um, uh, sort of managed like we're of course hoping <laughs> and, and, and to some degree already are, are trying to do. Um, and you know the other issue is what about global pandemics in the future? And of course that is a whole sort of debate going on right now of can we move from a pandemic to an endemic, E-N-D-E-M-I-C, which would be um, sort of like what um, regular influenza is that we'll need to get an annual vaccine. Uh, there will be spikes but the spikes are, are certainly less severe than what we've experienced with COVID. And that um, the, um, we'll basically learn how to manage uh, the disease in the future. But that's still very much a controversial debate going on. So again, um, we wanna kind of keep our horizons broad, 
and yet focus on the WHO and COVID-19. So the mandate of WHO, over the, it was over the past 70 years, so right after World War II when the United Nations was founded, WHO was one of the first agencies created uh, as part of the United Nations. It is, um, it's housed in Geneva, Switzerland, um, and with many other um, UN agencies, um, such as the World Trade Organization, um, the um, uh, Civil Justice uh, um, uh, Assembly, and, and other you know, formal agencies of United Nations. And I should say the setting of WHO in Geneva, right off of Lake Geneva. And I had the privilege, uh, most of my work has been in Latin America. And in fact, with the Pan American Health Organization, the uh, regional um, uh, stepchild of the, of the WHO. Um, but uh, I had the chance to spend um, most of the summer of, of uh, 2019 in Geneva and um, uh, working in a residency program uh, at WHO and, you know, and talking with other colleagues and such uh, to have that wonderful summer in Geneva and working with colleagues at WHO and just thinking that only, you know, four or five months into the future would be the the greatest crisis uh, that WHO and really our whole world population has faced. Um, but it is, um, uh, you know, it's had, had it's certainly its controversies and that's what we'll talk about today. Um, in, in the 70 year process, um, setting goals for health related goals for the United Nations. And there is a World Health Assembly uh, uh, representing the 100, 195 um, member nations. Um, and um, so you may have heard of, well, of course, for year 2000, there was the millennial goals. And that morphed into what are called the sustainable development goals. And they aren't just health related, they're, you know, human justice and economic development, and really the whole spectrum of, of you know, quality of life for, for humanity. Um, and um, you know, there have been some areas in particular where WHO took some major uh, stances and risk. And I, I guess the one I uh, was most uh, involved with was in tobacco, where um, in, the, um, uh, in the 1990s, uh, where um, WHO um, took a very strong stance in terms of tobacco control um, tobacco ordinances and prevention. And so that's, of course, chronic disease rather than communicable disease, but there have been some real accomplishments as well as, of course, monitoring of communicable disease. Um, in terms of the convener for the United Nations and other international agencies, that's where we've seen more and more of the issues of WHO do go up to the uh, General Assembly of the United Nations, uh, of course, headquartered in New York, um, and uh, and even the Security um, Council, uh, which is you know the five standing. It's a 15 nation um, uh, body of uh, the U.S., China, Russia, France, and um, United Kingdom, plus 10 other uh, nations that rotate. But um, they have met. Um, uh, you know, several times over the past uh, two years during COVID-19, whether it's dealing with issues of international travel, whether it's dealing with issues of, um, you know, migration, you know, mass migration due to um, COVID-19. And so, again, um, the United Nations takes that sort of very much hands-on role because of the you know, the, the priority of, of controlling the, the, the virus, the spread of the virus. Um, and I guess the last point is that providing guidance to member nations so that WHO has been very um, careful uh, in the past about um, trying to assume 
a more of a, um, you know, direct regulatory, um, you know, kind of strong authoritative role with member nations. It really, it's been providing guidance um, and, and that's part of the controversy going forward is, you know, can we afford just a, a uh, sort of a optional uh, guidance kind of role for, for WHO? So the overview, and gosh, this could be, you know, a couple hour presentation, just this one slide, but, um, you know, the extent of the COVID-19 pandemic um, and, and of course more in the past year, the things that aren't included in the in the briefing book, but you know the Delta variant and the Omicron variant. Um, of course, the origin of the of COVID nineteen was you know in China. Um, there's a lot of controversy about the nature of that um, uh, causation, um, but that was really you know the the epicenter uh, to beginning in the beginning. Um, and, you know, you can go through all the sequences of what's happened in the past two years. Um, clearly, um, one key role was surveillance in tracking, you know, infections, although that's been very challenging because, you know, infections are with COVID are, you know, oftentimes asymptomatic. So then that requires a massive testing effort to track infections. Um, Hospitalizations, which actually is probably the, um, in many ways, the most impactful measure, um, because it really does test the, you know, the capacity of each country, of each region of each country, um, in terms of, you know, the, the number of patients, of course, even breaking it down further between intensive care unit patients versus non-intensive care, non-ICU patients in the hospital. And then finally, um, deaths. And of course, where it's so staggering, and the numbers still kind of boggle in my mind, but that, um, you know, over the last two years now, we've had 400 million, I'm just grabbing my, my one set of notes here. Um, sorry about that. Um, 400 million cases worldwide, out of, of course, you know, 8 billion uh, population worldwide. Um, but out of that 400 million, 70 million are from the United States. So, you know, way more than the proportion of the U.S. population to the world's population. And then likewise with deaths, 6 million deaths worldwide, but 1 million of, or approaching 1 million, we're in the 800,000 range right now, but approaching 1 million out of the 6 million deaths are from the United States. The second area is vaccine development and really the, the true um, victory <laughs> or miracle uh, of, of the last two years has been the development of, of, of really effective vaccines. Um, in the United States developed by two um, uh, private corporations, uh, you know, actually uh, both uh, also with um, uh, headquarters in Europe as well, Pfizer and Moderna. Um, but, you know, China has developed its, its uh, vaccine and, and, and Russia as well, a even smaller countries such as Cuba. Cuba has an incredibly effective vaccine that's been developed. Um, and, and the distribution is now the big challenge and we'll certainly talk about that. And then the strategies for mitigation. And this has probably been the the biggest challenge for WHO to communicate clearly, certainly for in our country, CDC to communicate clearly in terms of what is the effectiveness of masks? And that's still very debatable. What are the best strategies for social distancing? Um, and, and kind of a, a companion strategy of, of bubbles of creating kind of smaller pods of, of, of human interaction within a, a larger social distancing strategy for a given population uh, region-wide or even country-wide. Um, in fact, one note is it's just fascinating to watch uh, 
in the Winter Olympics, the bubble strategy that China is using right now. And it's very extreme, you know, in terms of how they're controlling uh, different people's access to different, um, uh, you know, with interactions with other people. Um, but uh, at least as we know so far, you know, a week into the Olympics, that the bubble strategy in, in China and in Beijing has worked well. Um, so that these are all issues that WHO has tried to be at the forefront of, certainly in communicating best practices, uh, providing technical assistance to countries that need it, um, and also giving feedback to countries that have taken um, strategies that perhaps are, are not scientifically valid, and at least trying to be an honest broker in terms of how um, all countries are, are approaching the uh, mitigation strategies. Uh, I should also give an um, acknowledgement to the leadership of Dr. Tedros J. Braces, who's the director of WHO. He was the previous um, uh, Minister of Health in Ethiopia. And he was appointed, I believe, in 2016, 2017. And he is the first WHO director from Africa. And this was at the time seen as a major um, uh, step forward for WHO. Uh, WHO had just come off of a, uh, I think, a very controversial uh, response to the Ebola um, crisis in um, West Africa and a lot of sense of that it was a lot of Americans and Europeans telling, you know, African countries, you know, what's good for them and not being inclusive enough in, in response and decision-making. So Dr. Tedros has, has come under fire, as you can imagine, um, in terms of just the nimbleness of response, uh, the clarity of response, and yet there are a lot of people who um, have, have believed that he's, he's probably been as good as, as, as humanly possible in terms of leading the organization in this uh, uh, you know, challenging uh, moment in time. Um, I also have to acknowledge that the United States withdrawing from the WHO, and this was you know, entirely under the Trump administration, and it was announced um, and took effect in the spring of 2020. And one of the very first actions that President Biden took uh, after the inauguration was to restore, to rejoin WHO. Um, of course, what the real impact was that for, um, you know, seven, eight months, WHO lost its um, largest source of funding. Uh, the U.S. has funded WHO, you know, way beyond its proportion of population over the years. And so it created truly a crisis of, of uh, how to keep WHO running um, with this, you know, horrendous cut in, in resources. And another aspect that's probably not been emphasized enough is the collaboration between the Centers for Disease Control, CDC, and WHO over the years. Um, that, um, you know, CDC, of course, has, you know, really was in challenging situations under the Trump administration, entirely apart from WHO, but um, that actually there was, um, kind of a, a gag order, you know, a gag rule of CDC staff not being able to work with or have anything to do with WHO during that time period. And as you know, you know, well, of course, the entire two years has been uh, to varying degrees a crisis situation. But, you know, to have that seven, eight months of lack of cooperation between CDC and WHO was a, was a major, major concern. So the, just a map to give you the, you know, really brief overview. Um, and this is infections. And I should say, um, and I, uh, the documentation of this is really from Johns Hopkins University and, but published by the New York Times. And the New York Times is just incredible in their uh, reporting of um, 
uh, COVID statistics, both nationally and internationally. And this is use a, a, a framework called hotspots. And that's actually a statistical methodology called hotspots for tracking COVID-19. And so it represents the, the last um, 30 days. So it smooths out some of the day-to-day -day, you know, um, spikes, uh, but it captures the, the broader spike of a you know, month to month basis. And as you can see, I mean, the key headline is the United States and Europe are, are not out of the woods. Um, it is sense that with the Omicron variant, you know, starting very initially to decline, uh, but still compared to other countries throughout the world, you know, it's where the greatest um, uh, danger is of, of number of inf infected uh, individuals. Actually, in this morning's New York Times, the Russia was identified as being the number one hotspot in the world right now. Of course, that changes, you know, U.S. has been many times the, you know, the worst um, hotspot of of the world, but uh, at this point, the, the Russia has really um, had an ongoing crisis, along with everybody else. But um, to be highlighted, uh, another highlight is uh, South America, where and Brazil and Argentina are the um, greatest concern. And um, again, you know, some of the work that's been done uh, to you know, try to support our neighbors to the South um, in terms of, of um, especially vaccination. And so that's where a massive effort going on right now. The number one priority in, of the Pan American Health Organization is the vaccination program in Brazil. Um, but the, the big, um, uh, well, there's, there's two areas to highlight that are either mysterious or incredibly uh, um, uh, uh, successful. Uh, of course, mainland China is the incredible success. It was the origin of the virus, and yet they have had the lowest infection rate, lowest um, uh, death rate, um, as reported to WHO. Now, I'll talk about it in a couple minutes. Some of the data from China has been very controversial. Have they purposely underreported their data? And in fact, even during the Olympics, um, there seems to be general consensus consensus that in uh, in Beijing, or at least in the areas of Beijing that are you know where the um, Olympics are taking place, um, that you know there has not been any sort of outbreak, but um, you know, there's rumors of other cities throughout um, China where there are some terrible outbreaks going on. But in the data they've reported um, that it's a very low rate. Um, I also wanna highlight India. India is where the Delta Omicron, uh, Delta variant started. Um, and when the Delta variant took off, it was a true crisis. Um, but they have um, been able to um, control the Delta variant uh, as it subsided, and they have not had the kind of crisis outbreak in Omicron. And so India is actually seen as one of the success stories um, because of the, their history of major challenges, and yet their more recent uh, favorable experience. And then finally, Africa. And it is just there's one school of thought that Africa is a ticking time bomb ready to have its first major outbreak. But um, actually Omicron started in South Africa, uh, but, um, uh, and, and it did have a spike, uh, but within the more the um, urban areas and the townships of the major cities uh, of South Africa, not in the rural areas. And then in the rural areas of the rest of of Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, the rates have been remarkably low. And so uh, again, one of the challenges uh, is in terms of uh, for vaccines, that's, that's where the 
uh, lowest rates of vaccinations are in the world. And yet, um, despite that, uh, they've had some of the most favorable uh, infection rates. So, um, you know, in terms of the limitations for WHO, um, I mentioned, uh, of course, the US budget cut, which has now been restored, but, you know, for a half a year caused a major crisis. Um, and just over time, they've relied more and more on voluntary contributions. And that's where someone like the Bill Gates Foundation has come into play, is that they have stepped in to fill the breach. Um, other organizations such as um, uh, that are fundraising for um, uh, international health have um, tried to support WHO, but WHO really should not have to rely on you know, voluntary contributions. It should rely on a stable government-based um, approach. And so this issue of emergency appeals um, has been, you know, or do we, or the need for enforcement powers? Should there be a, um, a world budget, uh, I guess somewhat akin to the United Nations, um, but perhaps even more um, uh, structured, and that um, again, the you know, the concern is is that we've relied on an, a international organization that has just not been adequately funded, uh, and so um, there is an interesting response to um, you know from people at WHO and from other countries uh, currently, which is yes, it's it's wonderful your new president Biden has restored the. Uh, relationships and the funding for WHO, but for example, what happens if um, you know the Congress changes leadership in 2022? Much less, you know, if if Trump comes back into the presidency in 2024. So there's a lot of uh, skepticism and nervousness about the stability of funding from the U.S. And China's influence is just fascinating. China does not fund the WHO nearly to the proportion of its population that the US does. Um, and yet China has tried to take on much, much more of a influential role within, uh, within WHO, uh, within programs, staffing, uh, representation on you know, committees and boards. Um, and so there's a lot of concern that uh, you know, here they're they're trying to work very proactively with WHO. Some, of course, would say in a not necessarily um, constructive way, um, but that they need to really step up uh, their funding. Um, and so, and of course, all this has been exacerbated exacerbated in uh, during COVID nineteen. Now, I do want to raise two historical. Uh, touch points that really set the stage for WHO's response in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, one was the SARS outbreak, and SARS was another respiratory infectious disease, um, and it also broke out in markets and um, just as, you know, the um, uh, origins of, of uh, COVID-19 in the markets of Wuhan. Uh, that this was in the markets of Guangdong and other uh, more Southern Chinese cities, um, but it started to spread really fast. And the key concern was that the government of China tried to cover up the um, spread of the disease. And in fact, very actively resisted um, international scientists and public health officials from coming to China and doing all the steps necessary for, you know, tracking and testing and, um, you know, of course, um, starting on vaccine development. And so it, it, it didn't uh, end up um, jumping to other nearby countries such as Japan and Korea as people were extremely worried about at the time. Um, but it was setting off all sorts of alarm bells at, at WHO and that we need to get in there. We need to 
be able to understand what is going on in China with this new outbreak. And, and likewise with CDC. Um, and, um, and finally it did um, peter out in, in 2004, um, but that really created a, a, a backlash among other countries, especially European countries. And I should say also in the George W. Bush administration. George W. Bush, there's a fascinating recounting of some of the history of how he was so shaken by the, um, uh, the reports during that month or two coming out of China uh, and the inability to, you know, to be able to come in and help control it, um, that there was a big push to, um, to create this International Health Regulations Treaty that was passed in 2005. And it still today is the structure for the WHO's um, legal authority um, with, um, uh, especially with communicable disease. And there was a success story um, in 2009 and it was in the spring of 2009. So right after the, uh, uh, Barack Obama came into the presidency, and it was in it was H1N1 with, again, a, a very uh, contagious uh, respiratory viral disease. Um, and there was just, it was the total polar opposite of, of what the experience was in China with SARS. There was, um, you know, the Mexican government welcomed in, you know, all, any and all scientists and um, there was great cooperation. In fact, CDC kind of had a, a shining moment where uh, it played very much of a hands-on role. And that was primarily um, due to the you know, favorable um, uh, diplomatic relations between the US and Mexico at the time. And, um, and that the, the disease was um, controlled within one month. Um, and in fact, as they've done some of the post, you know, analysis over the past few years, um, realizing that H1N1, had it been, had it jumped to the United States, had it jumped to Europe, jumped to the rest of South and, or rest of Latin America, could have been, you know, just as bad as COVID-19. But again, uh, was sort of the, the best case scenario for um, control the disease. And, and again, uh, that set the stage for this, um, you know, looking at, at COVID-19 both as what could go wrong, but also if we do things right, how can we, how can we control it? And so that's where this crucial, crucial period of time in January, February of 2020 um, was um, looking back, and of course, you know, they're already beginning to be, you know, the books coming out about the history of COVID-19 and um, in that period, and not to say that, you know, necessarily could have been controlled, um, but uh, it could have been kept a lot worse, a lot better. <laughs> uh, and, um, and so for you all to remember when that enormous spike happened in Italy. You know, that was seen as kind of the, the key turning point was, and then from Italy, it spread across Europe and into the United States, but um, uh, that they're really, you know, the key leadership in WHO and other nations, hands were tied. Um, and it was the specific dates are in the legal structure of the, um, uh, the you know, treaty, the pandemic treaty that I mentioned passed in 2005. Uh, the first step was this public health emergency of international concern, PHEIC. And that was issued on January um, 31st uh, of 2020. And of course, there was a lot of feedback that that actually was allowed to, to be pushed back. It should have been, uh, you know, first or second week of January, but nonetheless, that was issued. 
And that um, then triggered the obligation for China to uh, allow for some level of cooperation in terms of the um, uh, control of the pandemic. Uh, it also definitely was the key basis for the interventions that were done in, in Italy and subsequently um, in Europe. But again, a lot of concern that that January 31st day was too slow uh, for protecting um, the, the transmission into Europe and the United States. And then by March 11th, you know, the, the crisis was in full, full mode. Um, and that's uh, when, of course, WHO issued the declaration of pandemic. Um, it, that brought on another additional set of legal authorities, but again, it almost was irrelevant by that point. And at that period of time, and there is now, you know, very much the perspective and the Omicron virus uh, or variant, the Omicron variant, um, if you remember, there was those two or three weeks and I believe it was in November, I'm now forgetting all the different dates here, but um, uh, where it was, it was um, identified in South Africa. South Africa did an incredible job of bringing in WHO scientists and, and other leading experts. And yes, it did you know, spread like wildfire, but at least there was an early on understanding of the nature of the transmission. And most importantly, that it was not as severe um, a uh, impact on hospitalization and deaths. Um, so that it's that early, you know, initial identification that's, that's so crucial. And of course, what adds to the controversy in, for China's role is, is the mystery of how the disease got started in the first place. You know, the, the question of whether it was from bats uh, in this area of Wuhan, China, and Northern China, uh, the wet markets, which are the, um, I guess the, where bats and other very exotic, you know, wildlife are, are sold for um, food and other <laughs> purposes. And then I know a whole other, you know, concern was, you know, that it was for military research, that it, it does, so happen that the leading military research center in China, and when I say uh, military research, I'm referring to um, you know bioweapons um, for uh, military purposes. And so you know the 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 conspiracies have just swirled for the last two years around that. Um, there's it's sort of gone in in ebbs and flows. There, of course. You know, in the Trump administration, it was called the China virus, you know, and, and uh, was um, sort of labeled in a, you know, obviously aggressive, demeaning way. Um, there's almost been a, a push to really hold back on any questioning of, of China's role over the past several months. Um, and even leading up to the Olympics, you can just see that, you know, it's like, <laughs> Everybody wants to make sure that things go go well with the Olympics and and to uh, um, to not press this issue. But I think over time, there's, it's going to the real question is going to be what accountability did China have? Um, and then I guess just the the sheer complexity and um, and difficulty of understanding the scientific evidence on. Transmission, wearing masks, as you know, is, is so controversial. Um, the social distancing that I mentioned before. And, um, and I guess WHO's role is to play, you know, kind of the best practices role. Just one example, tangible one, is that WHO has, has issued guidance on children in schools that is actually... Um, uh, different, substantially different than what CDC has issued in terms of school-aged children. Um, certainly in terms of, uh, you know, things like the uh, ventilation system in a school and um, 
you know, number of kids in a classroom and such, but the vac the um, uh, the mask wearing and even you know the question of the vaccines under the age of five. Um, so that uh, again, I think that there's it's it, it's it's really hard to make some of these judgment calls. And then finally, the emergence of the variants and that the Delta and Omicron, and you know I think we're we're faced with the future of having um, these kind of variants um, come and go. Let's see, uh, my computer is frozen. So there we go, okay. Um, so I do have a cartoon <laughs> just to uh, show kind of how it's been. Um, the person at the podium is Dr. Tedros, you know, <laughs> the, the president, the executive director of WHO and you know vigorously defending china they even made special masks for us and that covers up his eyes and there is a lot of questions um i even heard um i'll give a plug in for what i think is the best podcast regarding covid19 and that's uh dr michael osterholm you know from the university of minnesota epidemiology program and of course you know <laughs> so astute uh, locally uh, nationwide and worldwide and he's you know, raised a lot of questions about how China has impeded the, the work of WHO. Uh, but, not, but at the same time, I should emphasize, and I have to balance this out, that we need their cooperation. So we need to work with them as best as we can, uh, despite whatever misgivings that there have been. So as I mentioned, the um, success story of all success stories has been the vaccine development. And without going into the science of it, but you know, the incredible new technologies behind the um, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, um, vaccine development in, in other countries. Um, the one big question has been intellectual property rights and whether, um, you know, for example, Pfizer and the really the test case has been in, in India, you know, where Pfizer can work cooperatively with pharmaceutical companies in India without losing its intellectual property rights, but also not, you know, having protections against, you know, excessive uh, pricing and, and profits. Um, so it's, it's really been an example of an incredible um, effectiveness, the operation warp speed you know, which was entirely, you know, under the Trump administration and just what an incredible success it was. Um, COVAX is um, what WHO has taken on directly, uh, the Cooperation and Vaccination Program uh, for low-income countries with the goal of worldwide coverage um, and already over halfway, <laughs> uh, um, 4 billion out of 8 billion partially or fully vaccinated. And, um, and of course, since a large portion of that is in Africa, which thankfully has not had you know, horrible outbreaks to date. Um, the vaccine diplomacy, and that's where um, countries uh, like Russia and China have been very adept at, um, Russia has this, um, vaccine called Sputnik, like the, you know, like the late 50s uh, 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 orbiting uh, uh, satellite. And China has the Sino um, vaccine and um, that they have been very effective in distributing uh, vaccines in countries that um, where it's been to their um, synergy of development. So, um, uh, Again, like with um, with India, uh, the, um, they've actually played a very important role, uh, but a very strategic role in, in supporting um, uh, vaccine distribution. Uh, and the U.S. diplomacy, and I should say that, that in you know in Central and South America, there's been a, certainly an enormous effort in the U.S. for that. Although, again, you know, Chile decided to have its entire vaccine program based on the Chinese vaccine. And that's because of some of uh, um, 
uh, China's strategy working with Chile and Peru in South America. So this whole kind of combining of international diplomacy with vaccine distribution. Um, misinformation and resistance to vaccination is truly worldwide. And I mean, we're even seeing it now with the Canadians at the, you know, the truckers in uh, Ottawa, but um, that it's just ongoing drumbeat for, for WHO, as well as, you know, <laughs> CDC and, you know, other, um, you know, national information, health information networks to um, just keep at it in terms of, of the addressing misinformation. Um, also, WHO's role in creating the vaccine passport for legal documentation of travel, for access to public places, spaces, you know, so, you know, like getting to, uh, into restaurants and concerts and such, and having standardized information for um, proof of vaccination. And then all of the questions around boosters, uh, vaccines vis-a-vis -vis variants, um, vaccines with, in young children, and that's just a continuing uh, stream of, of different um, priorities. So here's a map of vaccinations, and um, as you can see, mainland China is, you know, at the top of the, <laughs> of the list in terms of their success, um, and, and actually there is a pretty strong sense that their va high vaccination rates are legitimate, even though their reporting of infections is come under a lot of scrutiny, that they have been just enormously effective with, uh, uh, with their vaccination program. And then as you can see, uh, many countries in Europe um, and um, in Canada, I mean, that, actually that was one thing in a uh, TV report I saw last night about the truckers, you know, in, in Ottawa was that, you know, actually in terms of public opinion, um, they are in a very small minority, much smaller than had there been an equivalent protest in the, in the U.S. that, you know, Canadians have been very cooperative, compliant with, uh, with vaccinations. Um, and then in South America, and it's interesting because Brazil and Argentina mentioned was a, a major concern, and it has been, you know, a major, major priority, um, along with Colombia, Ecuador, uh, for um, vaccination programs. Uh, oh, and I forgot to mention Australia, and it's fascinating to read about the accounts of the tennis tournament, the Australian Open, and the, um, the leading... Um, uh, tennis star not being able to uh, participate and, and that Australia has taken very seriously its, its vaccination program. So I, the, the key um, legal and legislative uh, priority at WHO has been the uh, reform of the International Health Regulations Treaty, uh, otherwise known as the Pandemic Treaty. <laughs> um, but it, it deals with the equitable distribution of diagnostic tests, drugs, and vaccines. And that is at the heart of the COVAX vaccination program. Uh, it also gets to, um, you know, other types of uh, treatment mo modalities uh, and then testing um, so that it really is trying to look at the full um, portfolio of, of different um, COVID-19 interventions. Um, the second point is really at the heart of this, which is holding individual countries accountable when WHO recommendations are ignored. And I mean, this is, this is really um, kind of calling out um, China. Uh, it also is calling out kind of rogue nations, if you will, uh, one kind of isolated example, but in South America, Bolivia has, has not been um, compliant uh, hardly at all. Um, and other, other you know, isolated uh, uh, nations uh, around the world. 
um, but also in terms of reporting um, that, in fact, there's some sense that uh, that's the place to start with, um, with the more um, stringent accountabilities is at the very least with full reporting. Um, so that the criteria for voluntary compliance, maybe, you know, that's where um, masking and social distancing uh, may be more voluntary in nature, but that mandatory compliance would be with surveillance um, and, and tracking, you know, new outbreaks. Um, the, the Europeans have actually led the way. It's interesting, the United States, um, even with getting back into the WHO um, with the Biden administration. Um, and the Biden administration has been really quite proactive with, um, uh, you know, with funding the worldwide uh, vac vaccination efforts. Um, but it has, it has been a little bit more careful about pushing the, um, uh, this more stringent kind of accountability um, for um, controlling pandemics. And um, the other thing just politically is that the United Nations um, charter requires for a legally binding treaty to have uh, two thirds of member nations um, vote for the um, passage. And there's just concern that there won't be the votes. And of course, concerns about objections from China, number one, but not just China individually, but countries that China has, you know, the greatest uh, influence on in terms of its international support and development, and just the impact on lower income countries. So the concern is in all those African countries, which have had low rates of infection for COVID, but they would be um, required for um, reporting and other um, responsibilities that may not have uh, financial support that comes with it. And so, um, you know, just the, in terms of counting up to 194 nations that uh, all the lower income countries are so crucial in terms of, of its passage. So uh, that's a, a major issue. So I guess, uh, you know, the question is what has WHO done well um, and what could it have done differently? And Chris talked a great deal about uh, the initial response from China, the withdrawal by the US, um, the Chinese experience in SARS in 2003, um, the question of the uh, international health regulations um, uh, not being legally enforceable, but, uh, needing a great deal of tactical uh, cooperation. Um, and we're just going to be dealing with the, the full, you know, spectrum of COVID responses into the future of testing, treatment, uh, vaccines, and, and surveillance. Um, and I, I just want to emphasize this notion of transitioning from a pandemic to endemic. And of course, the starting point is an epidemic, you know, and that's where there's kind of isolated um, spikes of a certain, you know, condition. Um, and then when it starts to rapidly take off into uh, international transmission and becomes a worldwide, you know, uh, um, set of, uh, you know, contagions, then it's a pandemic. But then this final phase is an endemic, and that's really this notion that uh, the disease is going to be, you know, here to stay. Um, that we're going to see occasional spikes, but if we're smart, if we have, you know, strong vaccination programs um, and update those vaccines to respond to the whatever new variants come along, and um, and have good control in terms of of um, you know even can potentially having to reinstitute some of the social distancing and masking, uh, you know, the, if for a isolated crisis, but to keep it isolated, there needs to be rapid intervention. 
And so, you know, an example is even um, influenza. You know, we have to get an influenza vaccine every year. Um, and, and influenza is an example of an endemic. Yes, there are deaths due to influenza every year. Yes, there occasionally is more of a spike in certain communities, but is, can be quickly extinguished. And so this idea of moving to an endemic is, is really um, our future. And I, I should say, again, another plug for Mike Osterholm, his description of what life will be like in, in an endemic is, is really um, fascinating. And so uh, where does WHO go from here? Uh, certainly the immediate priorities of managing the ongoing, you know, crises that come up, acting very, very quickly as, as new variants come up, new spikes or clusters come up. Uh, so ongoing um, accountabilities for China, uh, for the U.S., again, uh, you know, the feedback from others is the U.S. is doing really quite well in in cooperating with the world community on COVID as we speak, but let's say in 2024, we may go back to this previous, uh, you know, uh, era of, uh, of, you know, the Trump administration. So um, that everybody is kind of <laughs> wants to kind of keep each other accountable for, for how the cooperation goes. Um, and then key treatment issues, and I haven't talked much about treatment, but one issue on an ongoing basis is this phenomenon of long COVID, of people who instead of being just having symptoms for a couple of weeks, have had you know month after month after month with just extremely disturbing symptoms of you know loss of, loss of uh, cognition or um, you know almost like permanent disability kind of symptoms. So this long COVID is going to be I think a key priority going forward. The efficacy of the vaccines, the concern that the vaccines work well now, but what about with new um, uh, variants? Uh, you know, what would be the schedule of boosters, et cetera? And this issue of surveillance and having complete surveillance uh, rather than this voluntary mode. And then finally, just the notion of emergency preparedness to be able to respond to a, a crisis right away. Um, rather than, uh, uh, than an ongoing endemic mode, which is what we hope to eventually get to, which is it's a, a manageable um, uh, pattern of, of contagion and treatment and, and, um, and prevention. So with that, thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. I will just start right off here because we have lots of good questions. Okay. Um, why is the U.S. record, says the first questioner, of cases and deaths um, so bad compared to other countries? We have a disproportionate share of both the world's cases of COVID and of deaths. Why? What is the explanation for that? Well, at this point in time, the major concern is our low rates of vaccination. And that, um, that whereas, you know, other countries are, um, you know, 80, 85%, uh, um, we're still well below that in the 60% range. And I know there's different ways to calculate the vaccination rate of, you know, um, fully vaccinated, partially vaccinated, but still we're significantly lower. Um, I guess going back in time, if you look at the data from, you know, the very beginning from, you know, February, March of 2020, um, Europe had you know, a really horrific uh, set of experiences uh, with that initial wave. Uh, the U.S. kind of quickly caught up to it, but there was this um, uh, concern about, and again, um, it gets to the lack of compliance with um, social distancing. Um, there's a whole controversy about um, climate, you know, and does it, is it, uh, you know, where people are indoors in the wintertime in northern latitudes and 
you know, does that create, um, uh, you know, the aerosol transmission of, of uh, uh, respiratory illness? And so um, that, that's been a really mixed question. Um, but it, no, I mean, it, it, it really comes down to um, the initial spread of the disease and how that occurred um, when it jumped from China to Italy and the rest of Europe and then on to the, the US, um, how the US responded in terms of that Im initial wave of, or set of, you know, social distancing and, and uh, mass wearing, uh, which was mixed. Um, and then the, in the last year, it's been really a, the, the primary concern has been the lower rates of, of vaccination. Is it possible that Africa's lower rates of transmission are due to the fact that it's a, a, a very warm continent uh, with low air conditioning rates? Uh, would that affect uh, the transmission? Right, I mean, that is uh, the primary uh, leading theory. Um, and that it was interesting because um, when the Omicron virus first took off in South Africa, so the, you know, um, it wasn't so much in other Southern African countries of Zimbabwe and Botswana, but in the country of South Africa, it was really focused in the metropolitan areas. So again, you know, where it was more, um, you know, number of hours per day indoors was certainly mm -hmm. greater in mm -hmm. Johannesburg and in uh, uh, Cape Town, et cetera. So uh, that's the, the primary theory, uh, but there also is another theory where it's a catastrophe waiting to happen, you know, that, that there is gonna be some spark and still um, people don't understand why it wasn't Omicron, um, but that, uh, you know, that eventually with low vaccination rates, um, that there's bound to be some sort of major spike in Africa. Okay, the next question is kind of a logistic question. The person wants to know uh, what about the link for the recording of this presentation? And if you are interested, uh, anyone who's interested, email me. Uh, I'll put my email address in the chat line for those of you who don't have it. And I can give you the link. It won't be posted for a few days, uh, but I can definitely give you the link if you email me. Okay, moving on. China, what measures did China use during the SARS outbreak? Did those efforts affect how and why China uh, was able to implement a zero COVID policy? Well, um... Of course, there's an enormous amount of speculation about that. Um, the, the measures used in the SARS um, uh, transmission period in 2003, um, probably of all the different data that, that China released, the mortality data was the, the most um, reliable. Uh, and that um, it was, you know, and, and of course that's the nature of each one of these diseases has its own pattern of um, infection leading to mortality or not. And um, that the Chinese officials felt comfortable with basically saying, um, you know, that, um, that the mortality data is credible <laughs> um, and that I guess the, to the extent it was possible to validate it, um, that that was the case. The, the infection rates was just kind of, um, well, it's more difficult to measure to begin with. And then there was concerns that it was way underreported. Um, of course, the higher the transmission rate, the more urgent the need is to intervene. <laughs> um, and so to keep those numbers down, um, there was concern about uh, significant underreporting. Now, how it's led to the, um, you know, zero COVID policy now, you know, the just incredible infrastructure they built up around um, monitoring and, you know, everybody 
has a cell phone and and on everybody's cell phone is uh, tracking in terms of you know who they've been with or who they've been within six meters of in the past 24 hours. It's just it's unbelievable how they the kind of tracking that they built up. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, the phrase is contact tracing, but in the US contact tracing is, you know, getting on a phone and calling somebody. In China, they have this software that they've developed. So um, there's a real sense that, you know, this has been just an enormous priority for, for, for their government, for their country, for their people um, to have um, this kind of response to infectious disease and, and basically, um, uh, you know, the data integrity to the, to the side, um, that they do have a, a remarkable track record of high vaccination rates and that it's, it's just, you know, it's seen as almost like a national security issue and their president, Xi Jinping, has, you know, has made it happen. It's, it's, it's actually been quite an accomplishment. Would you say that their tracking and, and uh, mitigation methods are compatible at any level with American idea, with Western ideas about individual autonomy and... and uh, well, there was a moment of truth in, I guess, some of the initial <laughs> books about the history of COVID uh, but one moment of truth was that in the spring of 2020, um, that the major cell phone companies, um, uh, and I guess Bill Gates supposedly helped facilitate this, uh, came together and said we could develop a, you know, a national contract tracing program. Uh, using all you know existing technology but it's based on you know everybody in the u.s having a cell phone and um and they step back from it and you know and there's all sorts of speculation about that the trump administration supported and then ultimately get cold feet and pull back on it and but and now and then the question is does it fit with the uh, you know privacy and other individual rights of you know citizens yeah that's a that's a really big concern that's a big concern okay um i will ask i just want to remind the audience uh, we do have a number of questions and um, perhaps we have time for even more but if you have a question please put it in the q a line not the chat line so that i'm able to ask the questions in the order that we receive them all right um okay this question i think uh, okay, I think I'm going to go on to the next question here. Please expand on WHO guidance for children under five regarding vaccine and mitigation practices. I think you well, mentioned that there was a big difference between there. Yeah. And there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, of course, the you know in the United States it's the FDA, and and in Europe in the European Community they have their own equivalent of you know, FDA stands for Food and Drug Administration, which does the approval process for the vaccines in terms of uh, scientific, you know, efficacy and safety. Uh, and um, the European community has its equivalent of uh, the, you know, FDA. Um, and, and those have been the two bodies that have really done the, you know, the major work around evaluating um, different vaccines and that um, and then WHO has um, played more of a convening role um, and especially when it comes to um, again another set of controversies with Russia and China is this the um, uh, the Sputnik vaccine from Russia and the Sino vaccine from China um, have had greater problems with um, younger kids um, under the age of five. And I think even, I'm not sure what the age cutoff is, but maybe even a little bit older than five. And so within this kind of 
mosaic of you know different regulatory functions and different sets of you know studies and and different review and decision making processes um, that um, WHO has been, has tried to kind of maintain a balance, if you will. Um, for adults, it's been much more clear cut. You know, I mean, again, the the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines just kind of race through the uh, Operation Warp Speed, no less, uh, the review process of FDA. And, and likewise, in Europe, the major one was the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, but when it's come to kids, the results are mixed. And I think there's just a lot of caution. Um, uh, the US is, um, you know, trying to um, move in the direction of younger kids. Um, and WHO is trying to balance across, you know, these different vaccines as well that have, that have had even greater problems. Okay, next question. Why has the U.S. not adopted the WHO vaccine passport? Could you, what is the WHO vaccine passport? So what the WHO did, there is no one document that WHO uh, has issued and saying all the countries in the world shall use this. It's really the same principle as a, as a um, passport um, you know, a, a regular passport, which is that each nation issues its own vaccine passport. Um, but that WHO's role has been to develop standards for how the passport has is issued. Um, so, you know, does a doctor need to sign the passport? Well, in the US, no, doesn't. Um, but do you need to have, you know, the specific dates of the passport, um, a vaccine on the passport. So, you know, and it's really in response to like the airline industry saying, help, you know, <laughs> how do we make sense of all this? Um, and so um, it's, it's, been, it's been where each country issues their own, but the expectations they conform with a worldwide set of standards. Okay. Um Here's an interesting question. After 37 years, says this uh, viewer, why is there no vaccine yet for the HIV virus? And yet the COVID vaccine seemed to arrive at uh, record pace. It did arrive at record pace. Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, I heard a response to a, a similar uh, question along those lines from uh, Dr. Tony Fauci, who of course was the person, you know, uh, just as he's been the key spokesperson for COVID-19 over the past two years, uh, he was the key spokesman uh, in the late 80s for the uh, AIDS HIV. Um, and it comes down to science and, and the nature of the, um, transmission, uh, you know, one is uh, blood or secretion born, and the other is respiratory aerosol born. Um, and, uh, and of course, there's a microbiology that I'm, I just, uh, uh, you know, am not conversant in, but um, uh, it's not a matter of, and then that was the key to the Tony Vouchy a response. It's not been a lack of will, that there has been just this enormous commitment um, to the um, vaccine development for AIDS. Um, and one other point which he kind of tamped down is that, you know, the real breakthrough for AIDS was the um, antiviral cocktail, you know, the three or four medications take, taken simultaneously. Uh, and that's what has, you know, turned the corner on AIDS in Africa and well throughout the world. And the, uh, you know, the, the the criticism, oh, well, you developed this great treatment, so then you, did, you know, didn't really need to go through with the vaccine development. And he was just absolutely adamant that no, that has not been the case. <laughs> 
Okay, um, this questioner suggests or wonders whether perhaps the United States um, unfortunate lead in deaths and cases has something to do with underreporting in other places, particularly in Africa where maybe communications aren't as good. Is it possible that there is underreporting of case numbers that, that artificially uh, holds down um, uh, case level or, or statistics in places like in Africa and, and uh, South America maybe? Yeah, no, that's absolutely a valid point. And, um, and, you know, again, in Africa, there has been a lot of discussion around, um, are there low rates? Uh, they're having such low rates. Is it, a you know, in the nature of underreporting? Um, but it's so consistently across the board, infections being lower. Um, hospitalizations or in, in Africa, it ends up being more clinic uh, or other medical provider, you know, contact. Um, and certainly, you know, with deaths, um, that, um, that in Africa, it seems like a, a real phenomenon. Um, of course, mainland China, and we've talked about the controversies there. Um, so, uh, and, and probably the most clear cut has been um, the comparison of the US and Europe. And that uh, the reporting in Europe is, you know, absolutely, you know, the very highest level along with the US and, and Canada. And, um, and even on a per capita basis um, in the past year, and I should say in the past year since the vaccine um, distribution has, has occurred, um, that there is something going on in the, in the US and, um, and at least the, the, the primary uh, school of thought is in the past six to nine months, that difference has been due to the lower vaccination rates. Okay. All right. Well, we've got a, a few more minutes and we've got quite a few more questions. So I'm just going to keep pushing through them and we'll see how many we can get. Next question. Um, are SARS and H1N1 considered endemic at this point or, or did they just disappear? Um, they really just disappeared. Um, and, and that's where, um, you know, there has been some school of thought that COVID-19 would just disappear. Um, but the variance is what makes the difference that, that the, um, the experience was that SARS and especially H1N1 didn't go on and on allowing the mutations of the virus to occur to create variants. Um, so it's, it's really gets back to this idea uh, that if there can be just this extremely intensive, rapid intervention. Um, as soon as the you know initial appearance of the virus occurs, that um, that that's what can prevent you know the ongoing nature of the of the illness. Um, there have been a couple of um, well. There's you know all sorts of different examples. The swine flu of 1976. There was a, a flu outbreak in 1957, and each one kind of has its own special story. But it, I think, the kind of common wisdom is that quick, very uh, intensive response is what what makes the difference. Okay, we've got a couple of questions, more than one about Dr. Osterholm's uh, uh, endemic discussion, Dr. Osterholm's podcast. Uh, can you give me the name of Dr. Osterholm's podcast? And in this context, I should say to the audience that I have repeatedly reached out to Dr. Osterholm. I would love to have him appear on one of the programs that I sponsor. So far, uh, no no luck, yeah, but maybe that will, he's very busy, I know. Yeah, he he's so carefully manages his replies. He actually does have a strong commitment to, if you've noticed, to Minnesota um, media outlets um, mm -hmm. and, and addressing. I mean, he's, of course, right on top of all the major trends going on in Minnesota. 
but he really belongs to the nation and, and to the world, you know. <laughs> but Do you know the just, name of his podcast? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking it up right as we speak here. Um, well, it's, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll um, have it by the end of the... Um, okay, and then I can say minutes. to this questioner, I also can look it up and, and email yeah. it to the audience. Why don't, why don't you go ahead and do that? Okay, yeah. let, let's move on. What would it take to establish a national tracking program uh, for the United States? Is such a thing possible here, given our decentralized, uh, you know, tendencies? Right. I mean, that really is, you know, the, the role of CDC and um, that we have this 220 year history of relying on, um, on states to follow, you know, national guidelines and um, that uh, uh, in several key points over the past couple of years, um, you know, there's been the pressure point of, you know, is this when we can um, really go forward with a, a, a very ambitious CDC initiative? And um, the main concern is the, the backlash, um, well, the backlash against vaccines, the backlash against masks, you know, and just that we do not have enough of a political consensus at this point. And then uh, this might be our last question, uh, but it's such a, a, a potent one. Um, the origins of the, vac of the uh, virus, um, it just seems the coincidence of the national you know, biological weapons research facility in Wuhan uh, being you know, there and the virus starting in Wuhan, did the virus escape perhaps, you know, unintentionally, certainly unintentionally, but as a, as a professional epidemiologist, what is your opinion? Did they, did, is this virus an escapee from a research lab? Well, actually I was reading last week that the CIA um, has taken on a particular um, focus of understanding, you know, the relationship between China's, you know, bioweapons uh, programs and, um, you know, and, and the, uh, the origins of COVID-19. Um, so that it's, you know, it's still a, a mystery. Uh, there's a lot of uh, reason to blame it on bats. <laughs> I mean, I guess that there's all sorts of genetic fingerprints that show no it really was bats um but nonetheless though you're right the 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 uh, coincidence is almost you know too much okay well i think we're just about out of uh, time here uh one of our viewers says uh just google osterholm podcast and it will come right up and i plan to do that after the uh uh, broadcast, and then I will send out the, the link to people. Um, I, well, I want to thank you so much, uh, Dr. John Oswald, for such a very interesting and timely um, uh, uh, event here. But I also want to thank the audience for such excellent questions. And I'd like to thank our tech uh, behind the scenes team. Thank you all so much. This uh, is the first uh, talk in this current session of Great Decisions Talks. The next one will be March 4th. So join us next month on Friday, March 4th, when uh, Todd Lefko, who's certainly well known to uh, audiences of Great Decisions, will be back speaking on global chains and national security. But for right now, I want to say thank you all so much and goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>